why did I say that? What was going through my mind? Is this what it feels like to float in space? Oh no, I forgot to wish them happy birthday. I wonder what the bus driver thought of me. Why did I forget to pat my dog on the way out? Would the prime minister like me? Do people really like me? Am I a good person? Does God really love me? Who am I to deserve God's love? Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Indrajaya. It is so good to have you here today. And I really believe that no matter who you are, and it doesn't matter what reason that you're here today, I believe that you're not here by coincidence. I really believe that you're meant somehow to be listening to the next few minutes about what God has to say for every single one of you. And I believe God has a word in season that He wants to say to you right where you are, right in your situation. And I believe it's not going to be a waste of time for you to spend uh, some time in church, some time just uh, leaning in and, and, and having your heart ready to listen and to receive what God ha wants to say to you today. I have right here with me this uh, piece of apple, and I'm going to do something with this apple a bit later on, but right now, I don't want anyone to focus on this apple uh, yet. I just want you to focus on me, all right? Doesn't matter who you are, whether you're at home or here, I want you to focus on me, and just don't look at the apple. Can we do that? Turn to your neighbor. If you're watching with someone, turn to your neighbor and say, don't look at the apple. Don't look at the apple. Yeah, just look at Daniel, all right? Uh, it's going to become important later on. Well, um, we are in the second week of our series called Galatians, and if you didn't join us last week, it's okay, I'm going to get you caught up real quick. Galatians is actually one of the 27 books that we can find in our New Testament Bible. Technically, it is not even a book, it is actually a letter, a letter written to a group of Christians in this region called Galatia. Uh, at the time, they were under the governance of the Roman Empire. And a guy by the name of Paul actually went out in about 40 AD and planted churches in this area called Galatia. And if you don't know who Paul was, Paul was a guy who used to persecute the Christians. So if you don't like Christians, you would like this guy Paul very much because he used to hate, hate, hate the Christians. He used to kill them. But on his way to kill even more Christians, guess what happened? Paul actually encountered the risen Savior, Jesus himself. And Paul had a life-change experience like nobody else. And from that moment on, Paul just, he went all out from being the persecutor of the Christians to become the number one proponent of the Christians and just started planting and preaching the gospel everywhere and planting churches around the world, all the way to Europe, all the way to Asia, all right? And um, when he went to this region called Galatia, he preached a very simple but a very powerful message. It was the message of the gospel of grace. Basically, Paul just told the believers, well, at the time, they were not believers yet, but Paul told the Gentiles, they were not Jewish people, and Paul told them about Jesus. Paul told them about this guy who came and did all kinds of miracles, but the number one miracle that happened to Jesus was that he died a criminal's death on the cross that he didn't deserve in order to become our substitute for our sin. And in the process, Jesus defeated Satan and sin and death, which, if you think about it, it is actually num our number one enemy, right? So Paul said to these Gentile people in Galatia, hey, if you put your faith in this person called Jesus who came for us, who came actually from God, who is actually God himself, and he proved that he was God in the flesh when he rose again from the dead on the third day. I mean, who could do that, right? Who could predict their own death and resurrection and actually did it? 
end with that simple message that God is for the people, God is not against the people, God is out to save people, not condemn people. A whole bunch of people in Galatia decided to want to follow this guy called Jesus, decided to put their faith in Jesus, and Paul left Galatia to continue to plant churches in other re parts of the region as well. But then, not too long after Paul left, what happened was a group of Jewish Christians, a group of Jewish believers told a different message of the gospel to these new Gentile believers. Paul is sent, <laughs> sorry, the, the Jewish, belie Jew Jewish believers, the Jewish leaders, essentially told the new Gentile believers, hey, you know what? It is not enough for you to just put your faith in Jesus, but you got to follow all the rules and regulations of the Jewish custom. You need to follow the, the feast, the festival, the circumcision, and you got to obey the laws, otherwise God will not accept you. So this is the teaching that these new converts in Galatia received from these Jewish believers, which is actually the teaching of all religions, if you think about it, right? Religion basically tells you this, all the religions in the world basically tells you the same thing. You've got to follow the rules or else. It doesn't matter which religion you follow. you got to believe in something for sure, but that is usually not enough. You've got to follow the rules or else, whereas the message of grace is totally different, isn't it? If you want to follow Jesus, it's very simple. Jesus simply says, believe in me and you don't need to do anything else. That's the difference between Christianity and religion. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship that you can have with your creator, God. And you can have this relationship through this person called Jesus Christ who came for us and came to save us. So basically, uh, Paul wrote this letter to the Galatian believers with a strong, strong reminder. That's the purpose of the letter. If you're wondering, like, what is the reason why Paul wrote this letter? The reason is very simple. Paul wanted to remind the Galatian believers, hey, that false gospel that you heard from the Jewish believers, don't listen to them. That's not the true gospel. Let me remind you, what is the true gospel? The true gospel is all about Jesus. It's not about you, it's not about what you do, but it's all about Jesus. And last week, Tim said very, very masterfully that Jesus came because he loved us. Jesus loved us unconditionally and eternally. Jesus saved us from the penalty, from the power of sin in our lives. And But that's not all. He made us into a community of servants and ambassadors that he's going to send out to all parts of the world so that this message of grace, this message of the, uh, the gospel can continue to perpetuate until everyone, everyone can come to a relationship with God just like we have a relationship with God. All right? So now, as we continue uh, studying this letter, Paul is, is he's wanting to tell the believers in Galatia, come on, I want you to go back to the first gospel that I taught you. This is the only true gospel. Don't believe in anything else. If you can read between the line, you can just imagine the, the anger almost in Paul's tone because he is so serious about the gospel. The gospel message is so important that you cannot afford to get it wrong. To get the gospel wrong is to get everything wrong. That's why it doesn't matter if you are Christian or not. You need to know what is the real and true message of the gospel. And the true message of the gospel is all about Jesus doing everything for us. And everything we do is only in response to the kindness, the love, and the grace that Jesus has shown us. All right? So let's pick up the story in Galatians chapter 3 where Paul is going to assure the Christians in Galatia that the first gospel that they heard from Paul is the only true gospel. What is that? All right? So here's the deal. In Galatians uh, 3, verse 1, Paul says this. All foolish Galatians. All right? Pay attention how many times he will, he's going to use the word foolish. All foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death 
was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. It was so clear to you, the message that Jesus Christ died on the cross to defeat Satan, to defeat sin, to defeat death, our number one enemy. And he did it as our substitute. We were supposed to die on that cross. We were supposed to be uh, suffering the consequences of our sin. But then Jesus took everything upon himself. And he said, even on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they are doing. They don't know what they're doing. A lot of you, you don't know what you're doing. I don't know a lot of times what I'm doing. Why do I keep doing wrong? Why do I keep doing things that I don't want to do? Why do I keep, you know, falling short of my own standard? Forget about God's standard. I kept falling short of my own standard that I set for myself. But thanks be to God through Jesus, His death, was made clear by Paul to every single one of the believers in Galatia and to us now that Jesus did it all because of his love, because of his grace for us. It's as clear as day why Jesus died on the cross. Then Paul continues. He says this. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course, the answer is no. Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. And then he said this, how foolish can you be? After starting your new lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? See, you couldn't do it on your own. You knew that already. You knew that even before I came to preach the gospel to you, that you keep falling short. And now you heard the message of the gospel and you were happy, you were thrilled that there's a God who loves us unconditionally and you trusted in that God. But now, why do you trust in your own effort? I think a lot of you right now, sometimes I have to admit myself as well, we could be as foolish as the believers in Galatia. Yeah, we believe in the gospel of grace. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for our sin and rose again. But then after we receive that good news, somehow, somehow, we believe that, okay, now I need to get it right on my own. Now it's up to me. Now it's up to my effort to please God. Now everything is left to me. You know, that is not the gospel. Paul says, you start with grace and then you continue with the grace of God in your day-to-day journey with God. That is the true gospel. That's why I love this message last week. It's not just at the beginning, but all throughout, Jesus is Lord, right? You need to continue to put your trust and faith in Him and follow Him and allow the Holy Spirit who lives inside you to do what he does so that it is not up to you anymore. It is not your effort anymore. You can't do that anymore. Some of you, you believe in grace, but the way you act, the way you put it on yourself, the way you expect other people to behave, everything is according to your own effort, according to people's effort. So, um, Definitely, you did not receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses, but because you put your trust in Jesus Christ, and you need to continue to do that, all right? And then Paul gave an example. Why doing things on our own, why keeping the law doesn't really work when it comes to having a relationship with God, all right? And he said this. The two are important, by the way. Paul is not saying you can do whatever you want, But you cannot mix the two together. This is what happened with the people in Galatia. They just mix grace and law, all right? And a lot of Christians today, that's what they do. They mix law and grace. And Paul says, you can't do that. You can't do that. And Paul is going to tell you why you can't do that, all right? So, in verse 15, he says this. Dear brothers and sisters, here's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. What happened? God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. And notice that the scripture does not say 
to his children as if, as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child, and that, of course, is Jesus Christ, right? So Paul said this. You know, you know this from your day-to-day -day life. For example, if I have a will, and in my will, I wrote, all right, if I die, or when I die, we will die someday, when I die, 50% of my inheritance, say, will go to Jaden, and I give 50% to the Rocks Church. Let's say that's in my will. Witnessed by the lawyer, everything is legal, everything is good. All right, 50% goes to Jaden, 50% goes to the Rocks. Now, suppose I die, and then it just so happened that Jaden just won the lottery before I die, and he became a multi, multi millionaire. All right? So, what happened is this the executor of my will thought about this and said, Wow, okay, uh, Jaden is rich now. He doesn't need the 50% of his dad's inheritance. I'm just going to decide to give everything to the Rocks Church. Can the executor do that? The answer is no, he cannot. Whatever I said in my will is legal is binding, is irrevocable agreement. No one can revoke it no matter what happened. This is exactly what happened with God's promises to Abraham, all right? God said to Abraham, I'm going to make you great. There's no condition, no if, no but, not if you do this, then I will do this. Nothing like that. In Genesis chapter 12, God says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. And the reason why I'm going to bless you is because I'm going to bless a lot of other nations through you. Your descendants are going to be great. And this is an unconditional promise from God. So in the Old Testament, what we call the Old Testament part of our Bible, we have this, this covenant called the Abrahamic covenant. It is an unconditional covenant between God and Abraham. All right? And this agreement, this covenant can never, ever be revoked. It is unconditional. And then Paul continues. This is what's confusing to a lot of people, all right? You know, when Jesus talked about the old covenant and the new covenant, people got confused because there are actually, okay, listen, everybody pay attention, there are actually more than one covenant in the Old Testament. And then Paul is going to explain that. In verse 17, Paul says this. This is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise, his unconditional promise, if the law given to Moses will undo all the promise that he made to Abraham. He's not going to do that, God says. Pay attention to the 430 years. This is the second covenant that happened, all right? And then Paul continues, verse 18. For if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. Graciously. All right? You don't receive an inheritance because you do something. Okay? Jaden doesn't need to do anything to receive an inheritance from me. Inheritance is something that you receive simply as a promise, all right? It is a, a unilateral agreement. It's only one person making that agreement. That is me, all right? In this case, it's only God. So what happened was 430 years after God made that agreement, that covenant with Abraham, God gave a new covenant, this time with Moses. That's why it's called the Mosaic Covenant. Now, this one is different from the first covenant in that this one is conditional. God promised to bless the people of Israel with conditions, all right? With conditions. Listen to some of the conditions. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, Exodus 19, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, if you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully keep his commands. See, there's, an, con there's a condition if you do this, and I will do that. But if you don't do this, then I will do something else, or I will not do that, all right? So, whereas the Abrahamic covenant, we receive 
by faith. All right? The Mosaic Covenant we receive by law. That means in order to receive the benefits of this covenant, you need to obey the law. All right? You need to obey the law. But notice, this does not negate, it does not cancel the earlier promise God made with Abraham. And that's what a lot of Christians don't understand. When Jesus talked about the old covenant, he was talking about the Mosaic covenant. That covenant that God made with the people of Israel. By the way, all right? The Mosaic covenant is not given so that the people can become God's people. It's actually not the case at all. The people of Israel were rescued before the Mosaic covenant was given, right? They were rescued from the slavery in Egypt because they were God's people. And then the Mosaic covenant, the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, was given not in order for the Hebrew people to become God's people, but because they are God's people. Now, that is something else that a lot of people don't understand. And you need to understand that in order not to get, you know, your, your context confused. And if you get this context confused, you're going to be confused with God because you think God is dealing with people differently and God is crazy for changing His mind with the two different covenants and all that. No, God is not crazy. He is still the same yesterday, today, and forever. The Mosaic law was not given in order for the Israelites to become God's people. They were given because they are already God's people. Because God loved them. God wanted to tell them what to do, uh, what, you know, to protect them, right? Out of God's love for them. So here's the surprising truth that I want all of you to know, okay? The surprising truth is this. The promise of righteousness through faith was made to Abraham before God gave Israel the law. Grace has always been God's modus operandi from the very beginning. It's always been like that, all right? God did not change. You know, God loves you unconditionally from the very beginning. God loves the whole people of the earth from the very beginning as shown in the Abrahamic covenant. The reason why God blessed Abraham is because God wants to bless the whole world, all right? Abraham and his seed, Abraham and his descendant. That's going to become important later. So the question that everybody asks is this then. Well, if God treats people unconditionally, and if we want to have a relationship with God, you know, God doesn't demand anything from us. Everything is unconditional. Everything is God's initiative. Then why was the law given, right? Why was the law given? This is the question that uh, Paul wanted to explain to the people of Galatia and now to us. Why then was the law given at all? Paul gave the answer. It was added because of transgressions. That's number one. And number two, it was added until the seed to whom the promise referred had come. All right? That means this mosaic law is not going to be forever. I'm going to tackle the second part first. It's not going to be forever. It's only temporary. All right? There is going to be the seed, the child, promise already to Abraham. Right? Not children, not plural, but one child. This child is going to institute the new covenant. And in the new covenant, it's going to be a repetition or an even better fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. This too is going to be unconditional. All right? So the Mosaic covenant is only given temporarily until, until the promised child had come, which is about 1,500 years later down the road. All right? So, Again, that's the second reason why the law was given. Let me go back to that verse again. Why was the law given? It was added because of transgression. It was added because of transgression. Now, people read this, and I read this the first time, and I thought, no wonder the law was given because people are so sinful, they need to be restrained so that they will stop sinning. That's what you understand. That's the understanding, right? That's the common understanding. Because people are so sinful, God gave the law 
so that they will stop sinning. They will stop breaking the law. Well, actually, that's not the reason why the law was given at all. That's not how you're supposed to read that. Let me read to you the New Living Translation version, which is a lot clearer, uh, and it carries out the idea in the Hebrew language a lot better. The NLT says this, Why was the law given? It was given alongside the promise, the promise made to Abraham, remember the first covenant, to show people their sins. Did you get that? The law was given to show you, to show me, that we are sinners. Not to keep us from sinning, to tell us who we really are. That we are actually already sinners with or without the law. The law is like a mirror to let you know that you are a sinner. That I am a sinner. When you see a sign on Leech Highway, 70 kilometers an hour, right? You're speeding on Leech Highway. You're doing 85. And you see the sign, 70. What do you say to yourself? Oh, this sign makes me a sinner. No, the sign doesn't make you a sinner. The sign doesn't make you breaking the law. You are already speeding, right? You are already going 85 an hour, the sign just tells you that you drive too fast, okay? And that's the human tendency. That's what we do. We call it sin. You can call it whatever you want. But every human being has this tendency to do the opposite of what we want to do, all right? I told you at the beginning not to look at this apple. How many of you could not help yourself but just from time to time Keep looking at the apple. That's what we do. I just proved to you that the law doesn't work to keep us from sinning. The law simply exposes the condition of our heart, right? If I tell you not to look up the ceiling, you're going to look up the ceiling. If I tell you not to think about pink elephant, you're going to think about pink elephant. Especially if I keep mentioning it again and again and again. Don't think about pink elephant. You better not think about pink elephant, all right? Then suddenly, you can't help it. You can't help it. Stop thinking about it. Start thinking about pink elephant in your mind. Why is that? Paul says, hey, that's what the law does. The law simply exposes the true condition of our heart. So the question is, is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Here's the answer. Let me go real quick now. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not, Paul says. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. So the problem is not with the law, Paul says. The problem is with us. You see, that's what the law is set out to do. That's the reason why the law is given. Uh, it's not that the law is bad. No, but the law cannot make you good. The law cannot make you righteous. The law cannot make you acceptable before God. The law simply exposes who we really are. But the scriptures, verse 22, declare that we are all prisoners of sin. That's, we know that because of the law. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. God, through Jesus Christ, wants to set us free. He wants to set you free from your inability to please God, from your inability to even live up to your own standard. And God does that through the person of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under God by the law. This is only temporary, remember, until Christ comes. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the way of faith was revealed. Let me put it another way, Paul says. The law was our guardian, tutor, pedag pedagogos in the, in the Greek, from the word from which we get the word pedagogy. The, the law was the guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ. And if you do, Paul says, this is the good news, all right? 
And now, by that way of faith, and now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. That's why the law is only temporary. For you are children of God, all of you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter who you are, your skin color, your sex, your gender. It doesn't matter at all. We are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Everyone has the same opportunity to come to God through Jesus Christ and have a relationship with our Creator God, our Heavenly Father. And verse 27, as we come to a conclusion, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promises to Abraham now belongs to you. Like I said before, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you have not done. It doesn't matter your sexual orientation. It doesn't matter. Nothing matters. All of us are in the same boat. All of us are sinners. All of us are imperfect. All right? You don't need me or anybody else to tell you that you are imperfect. That you cannot meet, let alone the demand of the law, you cannot meet the expectation of yourself, for yourself. That's why we need grace. Everybody needs grace. I need grace. You need grace. That's why relationship with God must start with us trusting Him. It must start with us believing in Him and accepting Him to be a part of our lives. Because the relationship that we have with God is not a business transaction. It is actually a relationship, right? A father-child relationship. God is your heavenly father. More than anything in the whole world, He wants you. More than your obedience, more than your money, more than anything, trust me, God wants you. He created you. He loves you. And He knows sin has done so much damage in your life, in my life. Satan, death, the consequence of sin that we even brought upon ourselves. God wants to free us from all of that, right? So what the law demanded through Moses, God provided freely through Jesus Christ. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, if you trust Him and Him alone, not only for your salvation, not only for your eternal life, but like Tim said last week, trust Him with your day-to-day -day life. He has a purpose for your life. He doesn't, He loves you just as you are, but He loves you too much to leave you that way. God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. He wants to include you in His plan to redeem the world, to save the world to Himself. It starts with grace and it's going to end with grace. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You because You love us so much, unconditionally, relentlessly. While we were still sinners, Jesus, you came and died for us. Thank you so much for your grace. Please forgive us if we ever mix our own effort with your wonderful grace. Father, we know that you who started the good work in us, you will carry it out until the end. Help us, Lord, to just be aware of your presence. Be aware of the the help of the Holy Spirit that is in us. Help us to live out your plan for us and for the world through us. Thank you so much for your grace. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. And thank you, Pastor D, for prepping and sharing that with us. It's so good to have that. 
Well, we're together again, and it's uh, bring bring us to our end. We want to uh, just remind you that there's uh, we'd love you to share some comments or you know your thought that you got out of that. Um, if you're online, please drop a message and just share what God has been spe- speaking to you from today. Yeah, that's right. So there is a little bell icon if you're on our YouTube channel. Make sure you click that to uh, keep in touch with what's happening around the life of our church. Um, and also, if you would love to partner with us financially, uh, you can head over to the rocks.info um, and under the giving tab, you can uh, fill out your details. Um, and we want to take this opportunity as well to just thank everyone who gives so generously to the life of our church. Yeah, we love to call people who give regularly uh, our kingdom builders. We, um, yeah, it's so, we're so glad that people are committed to giving. Um, the ways to give are going to be up on the screen. So, yeah, please um, look at those. And if that's where you're at, we'd be really grateful for that. So. That's right. And uh, after this, we will have the discussion questions from today's sermon on your screen. So make sure you pause it, you screenshot it, you take time with your family and friends to chat about uh, what uh, the message talked about today or even in your small, group, um, small groups this week. So make sure you screenshot that as well. That's correct. So that brings us to the end of today, Sunday. We're so grateful for those who have gathered and for those who have been with us online. We're so grateful that you've joined in. Again, like we thank you for um, just being so uh, committed to the church in this time. And the exciting news is next week. That's right. We're, we're all... back in the house. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be great. Good. So yeah. join us on the socials. Any news or information will come out on those. And uh, that pretty much finishes it for us. So that's yeah. goodbye from me. And Annika and Pete, and that's all from us. So thank, thank you, you very so much. much. See, See you, you later.